Well, I'm glad to welcome you tonight to our 14th lecture in church history. This is a course that's done at Fruitland Baptist Bible College. And today we're going to look at the rise of liberalism and the battle for the Bible. But I think it would be appropriate that I read scripture before we begin. So listen to what the Bible says about itself in 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 16 and 17. All scripture is inspired by God and is profitable for teaching, for rebuking, for correcting, for training in righteousness, so that the man of God may be complete, equipped for every good work. We believe that all scripture is inspired by God. Now, there have been many attacks on the Bible in church history, but most of the time they were attacks from people outside the church. Diocletian in 303 AD had ordered that all of the Christian holy books be found and burned and thought he had gotten rid of the last Bible only to be replaced by Constantine and the whole thing became a Christian empire. In the 1700s, a man named Voltaire, a French philosopher, boldly announced that within 100 years, the Bible could, will not be found. It'll be so obsolete, laughed at. Nobody will read the Bible because his writings were so much better than what you find in the Bible. So the question I have for you tonight is this, by show of hands, how many of you read Voltaire in recent days? How many of you have read the Bible in recent days? So well, I think he must have gotten that wrong, don't you? <sighs> What happened? This period of Voltaire was something called the Enlightenment. Before the Enlightenment, Christianity had taught people that their reason had been distorted by sin, so you cannot discover the truth on your own. You need the Bible. You need God's revelation in order to discover truth. But during the Enlightenment, they elevated reason and said, no, 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 reason is all you need to find out anything, any truth that you can stand on. You can discover it on your own. You don't need the Bible. In fact, Immanuel Kant wrote a book called Religion Within the Limits of Reason, and he created basically a religion that became known as deism. This was a very popular thing in the 1700s. Thomas Jefferson became a deist. Benjamin Franklin became a deist. These people basically said, there is a God. You can't deny that. God exists. But we don't believe that God's involved in this planet anymore. He, he wound it up like a clock and let it go. And he's not there to hear your prayers. He's not intervening. There are no miracles that have ever happened nor will ever happen. So they believed in the existence of God, but they denied any of the miraculous. And what Thomas Jefferson did as a deist was he took the Gospels and literally cut out every miracle that Jesus did. He called it the Jefferson Bible, and it ended with Jesus being put in the tomb, and that was it. That was the end of the Jefferson Bible, Jesus being buried. Can you imagine anything sadder than that? In the early 1900s, a president of Southern Seminary named E.Y. Mullins, I think, put his finger on diagnosing what is at the heart of liberalism. He said, liberals are people who have a prejudiced, a prejudice against the supernatural, against miracles. Now, prejudice means you decided in advance. They've decided in advance miracles can't happen, so we're going to go to the Bible, and we're going to explain away what you're seeing there. And so that's what happened. So... The father, the man that's considered the father of modern Christian liberalism was a man named Frederick Schleiermacher. Frederick Schleiermacher said that since reason can be used and that's all you need, he reasoned that the only reason that we stand on in our faith is what we experience with God. So he said basically our faith does not rest on any book, does not rest on any person, even Jesus. Uh, all of us have some sense of God, some sense of our need of God. He called that God consciousness. And he basically said, now this is a Lutheran pastor. He basically said that Jesus was simply the most God conscious person that has ever lived. So what we need to do is follow his example and open our hearts up to God and let God show himself to us. And then what he did was he defined that the Bible is not an inspired book. But the Bible is the musings, the writing down of God-conscious people through the years. This is how Moses felt like he met God. This is how Paul felt like he met God. This is how John. And so it's not a holy book. It's a record of God-conscious people writing down what they felt was their experience of God. So there was no death of Christ, no resurrection of Christ. 
Uh, none of that was needed. It was simply become a God-conscious person. That's within a Christian setting. Um, since the Bible is not divinely inspired, it's only a journal of those who have thought they've ex experienced God some way in the past, then the liberals began to say, what we need to do is treat the Bible like any other book. Uh, we can be critics of it, decide what is actually true and what is not. What applies to me today and what does not? It put us as the ones who rule over the Bible rather than the Bible being our rule of faith. And, and so what they did was they basically asserted that since there are no more miracles, since we decide what is true, when you read a Bible, a, a story of a miracle in the Bible, you've got to recognize that what you're really reading are exaggerations. That, that the more a story is told, the fish tale, the bigger the fish gets. For instance, they talked about the feeding of the 5,000, where Jesus saw the crowd, said they were hungry, and a little, took a little boy's five loaves and two fishes and fed 5,000. Well, what the liberals said was, no, that's not what happened. What happened was Jesus said, these folk are hungry and some have got food, some don't. We're going to have a disaster on our hands. What can we do? And a little boy who was up front and said, mister, would you like my lunch? And when that unselfish boy came forward and gave his lunch, the rest of the people who had been hoarding their lunches and those who didn't, they said, well, let's give him ours too. So everybody passed their lunch out, passed their lunch up to Jesus. He passed it out and there was more than enough. But as it was retold in generation after generation after Jesus, it got bigger and bigger and bigger. So what you have now is a Bible that is not divine. It is not accurate. It's simply a journal of how people experience God. Another turn in liberalism happened, and if you haven't noticed, these are all German names. Uh, Germany seems to be the home of liberalism. A man named Albert Reichel further defined Christianity as not being about getting to heaven one day. Christianity is about making earth better, bringing the kingdom to earth. Solving problems here, feeding hungry people here, bringing the kingdom of God here. And he redefined sin. Sin is simply selfishness. If we'll get rid of selfishness and forget about heaven, you could almost sing John Lennon's song as the hymn of this. You know, if we could just get rid of heaven and just concentrate on earth, we'll make this a better place. Richard Niebuhr was a professor at Harvard and he was a critic of this type of thinking. Uh, he said this that what you had Christianity become is a God without wrath who brought men without sin into a kingdom without judgment through a, cry, through a Christ without a cross. Um, and underlying all of this, because here we are moving into the 20th century, we're seeing this change in the way we approach Bible, is something called the theory of evolution. Now, the theory of evolution, I believe, has been disproved in so many ways. Now, the best that Darwin could do is take a microscope that had only of limited strength compared to what we can have today. He looked underneath the microscope and he saw what he saw, what he thought was a simple cell. And his theory was that simple cell will one day grow and multiply and continue to advance until it became something as complicated as you or I. And so the whole point of the theory of evolution is you don't need a God for all this to have happened, but also everything is advancing. It's going upwards. It's getting better, more complicated. Now, what we know now that Darwin didn't know is there's no such thing as a simple cell. DNA is so complicated, we can't even wrap our minds around it. And, and, and when you look at the second law of thermodynamics, for instance, things don't advance as they get older. Things break down as they get older. Uh, that's what happens with life. But here's this new theory. We're going from simple to complex. We're progressing. We're getting better and better. And so if you have that, the first thing you do is you throw away the book of Genesis because creation didn't happen. Evolution has, has said it, it didn't happen. But the second thing you do is you have an underlying attitude. We're advancing. Today, they'd use the word progressive. We're getting better. We're progressing. So why in the world would I listen to a book that's 2,000 years old when we're so far beyond that now? We have advanced so far. And so here you've got Christianity in the mainline uh, denominations and in Europe becoming something completely different than what it's been for 2,000 years. 
So what did the conservative Christians do in response? So we we're now heading into the 1920s for this particular response. What the conservative Christians did under the leadership of R.A. Torrey, that was the man that was mentored by D.L. Moody. They put together a series of books using conservative professors and they identified five key fundamental doctrines that we've got to draw a line in the sand on. We've got to stand and fight for these. Now, there's plenty of room for agreeing, disagreement on smaller things, but on these five fundamentals of the Christian faith, you've got to stand by them or you are no longer a Christian. And so the five fundamentals, about, let me chase a little rabbit here. Uh, years ago when I was pastor here in the 90s, I wrote an article in the newspaper that says, I'm a fundamentalist with a little f. Today, if you go by a church and it has on its sign, we are a fundamentalist church. What they probably mean is we use only the King James. There's no guitars or drums allowed. Women have to wear dresses and can't wear pants. There's a lot of legalistic things that identify somebody today as fundamentalist, but that's not how it was at the beginning. A fundamentalist was somebody saying, I've identified five truths that I will not yield on, we will stand for, we will fight for. Here are the five truths. Number one, the infallibility of the Bible. This is the inspired word of God and there are no errors in it. Number two, the virgin birth of Christ. It amazes me that the most often attacked miracle in the Bible by those who call themselves liberal Christians is the virgin birth of Christ. Number three, the third fundamental is that we believe that Jesus died for our sins, that our forgiveness is based upon him taking our place on the cross and dying for us. Number four, we believe in the bodily resurrection of Christ. That we believe that not just that he rose in influence or that his thought still is here with us. We believe that if you had your iPhone outside the empty tomb and he came out, you could have taken a picture of him because he really came out of that tomb. And then number five, we believe in the return of Jesus in the future. So those are the five fundamentals. And so the conservatives said, we've got to draw the line here. We've got to rally. If you don't believe those things, you're something other than a Christian. A, a, a great conservative professor named J. Gresham Machen wrote a book called Christianity and Liberalism. And in that book, he basically asserts that those who are in the liberal churches calling themselves Christians who've jettisoned the cross, jettisoned the virgin birth, jettisoned the bodily resurrection, he said, they need to be honest and admit they have now created a new religion. They are no longer Christians. That there's nothing in common between liberalism and, and, and what we read in the Bible. Now, those on the liberal side, they called themselves modernists in that day and time. Had their champion, and he was a Northern Baptist pastor named Harry Emerson Fosdick. Uh, he made it very well known that he did not believe in the virgin birth, but his most famous sermon was preached in New York City, and it was printed in uh, bestseller, and the sermon was entitled, Shall the Fundamentalist Win? He threw down the gauntlet and said, We're not going to let the fundamentalist win. And you know what? He was about right, because we lost most of the Christianity in the North. We lost the Christianity in Europe. The only place where there was some haven of conservative Christianity was in the South and especially in the Southern Baptist Convention. So why was it that until after World War II, we Southern Baptists were able to avoid uh, the liberalism that had taken over the seminaries and then began to take over the churches up North? Well, let me go back to the founding of our very first Southern Baptist Seminary. In 1859, the First Southern Baptist Seminary was founded on the campus of, Green, of Furman University in Greenville. They later moved to Louisville. So you've got the Southern Baptist Seminary in Louisville. Uh, there were four founding professors. The president was James Boyce. And James Boyce announced that we're going to do things differently with this seminary. Now, think about 1859 and Southern Baptist life. Most Southern Baptist pastors were bivocational. If they got any training, they're not going to have the ability to go four years of college, three years of seminary, and, and they're going to go back to those farmer churches, churches full of farmers. And so the first thing that Boyce did was he said this, we'll accept students who have not finished traditional college degrees. Seminary, by the way, usually was reserved for those who have a bachelor's degree. Then you go and get your master's and your doctorate. But he said, no, we'll take anybody, no matter what their education is. 
Another thing that they did differently at Southern Seminary, if you went to the more famous and now liberal seminaries up north, by the time you got to the master's level, you were required to have learned Greek and Hebrew. So if you took a Bible class, you had to study the Bible in Greek or study it in Hebrew. Well, here we've got Southern Baptist plowboy preachers. And so boy said, no, at Southern Seminary, our textbook for the Bible will be the English Bible. Then the only one they had was the King James Bible. So if you came to Bible class, you opened up your Bible and read it in English. That was something that was unique. Uh, the other thing that he did was he, he said, we'll have two tracks of study. We'll have that study for the typical pastor, that track that will produce those. But we'll also have equally to it uh, an academic track that will be as good and high as you'll find in any seminary that will go all the way to the PhD because his goal was that we would produce the people in the future who would teach our preachers. So we would not go to Harvard. We would not go to Oxford. We would not go to Germany to get professors, but that we would be able to provide people who've gone all the way through the PhD and they can come back and teach in our colleges and teach in our seminaries. So he had that second track, but then he added one more thing that we've just now recovered in our six seminaries. He created a doctrinal statement of faith. At that time, we had no official Baptist statement of faith, so he went and researched several that were used by different Baptist groups. And he came up with a statement of faith that anyone who taught at Southern Seminary had to sign every year saying, I still believe these basic doctrines. Because he felt like we've got to make sure that what's being taught in the classrooms reflects the pews, the churches that sent us their young men to be trained. And so we have that statement of faith. And because of these safeguards, liberalism did not invade Southern Baptist seminaries until the middle of the 1940s. Now, to show that they really did enforce this, as the seminary began to grow, they hired a fifth professor. His name was Crawford Toy. Uh, now, he had studied in Europe. But when he came there to teach at Louisville and when he started teaching, he taught the Old Testament and he taught that he believed that there was a flood, that he believed that those miracles happened. He believed, uh, but, but the things that he had learned in German liberal schools began to infect his thinking. So after a few years, he was now teaching the liberalism that he had learned in Europe. And Dr. Boyce and Dr. Broadus said, we can't not let this continue. We owe it to the people in the pews that what is being taught will reflect what they believe in their churches back home. And so they had to let him go. By the way, he had been engaged to a woman named Lottie Moon. They had met, fallen in love, and she went to, to, to serve another term, would come back, and they planned to marry. But in their letters, she could sense that he was leaving his first trust of the scripture for this liberalism and to her credit Lottie Moon broke off the engagement and remained single as a result the rest of her life because she would not marry somebody who did not have a high view of God's word well Boyce obviously brought us who was one of those four original teachers records what happened when the two of them took Crawford Toy to the railroad station Throwing his left arm around Toy's neck, Dr. Boyce lifted his right arm before him and said in a passion of grief, Oh, Toy, I would freely give that this arm be cut off if you could be where you were five years ago and stay there. And folks, he didn't. He went on, taught at Harvard, and became a Unitarian. Left traditional Christianity altogether. Well, that safeguard was there in place until... After World War II, I'll give you my best guess as to why the safeguard was listed. By the time you get to the middle 40s, Southern Baptists are the largest Protestant denomination. We wanted to have the respect that comes from being the largest. And one of the things that you get respect for is if your professors have degrees from the prestigious universities. And so instead of simply relying on those who are produced from our six seminaries, our seminaries began, because of the desire to have academic standing, go and get professors from Harvard, go and get professors from Oxford, go and get professors who'd studied in Germany. And what happened was that liberalism began to sway, take sway over the seminary. Uh, Noel Wesley Hollyfield was a doctoral student at Southern Seminary. He did a survey of the students in the 1970s and he tracked what they believed when they entered 
in, in, in their master's degree and what they believed once they got their master's degree, basically three years later. And what he found in his survey was that 100% of the students who entered Southern Seminary believed that Jesus was the Son of God when they entered, but only 63% believed in the divinity of Jesus when they graduated. But it was even worse when it came to the virgin birth. Three years later, when they got a master's degree, only 32% of the students believed that the virgin birth had really happened. So this was the experience of what people, we had churches sending their, their young people to the seminary and watching them lose their faith. I saw this with many of my peers. I went to a school that every professor had gone to Southern, every guest lectureship was from Southern. I did a personal poll in graduation line. We had 42 men graduate to, to, who had gone in there to study for the ministry at my Baptist college. Seven of us still believed in the infallibility of scripture. All the rest had been moved into that camp. This was changing our denomination. We began to have some sparks of a real fight. And the first spark happened in 1961. A professor at Midwestern Seminary in Kansas named Ralph Elliott published a commentary on Genesis and basically said the first 11 chapters are myth. They're fairy tale. There was no Adam and Eve. There was no Tower of Babel. There was no flood. And... One of the pastors in the convention, Owen White, the pastor at First Baptist Houston, when he read that, he got so incensed. He was to deliver the convention sermon the next year. He delivered a sermon entitled Death in the Pot. You know, that old story in the Old Testament where they ate something that poisoned them. He said, there's death in the pot. And so he got elected president of the Southern Baptist Convention that year. Uh, so they demanded that Midwestern do something about Ralph Elliott. And so Midwestern investigated and said, he's fine. And they did nothing. But what they did tell him was this, this book is controversial. So when you've run out of your first print, do not reprint it. Well, because it was so controversial and so popular, he ran through the first printing and then he had it reprinted and he did get fired from Midwestern, but he got fired from Midwestern for not obeying the trustees, not because of what he believed. And he even made this statement. He said, I don't know why they're upset. Every professor I know in the Southern Baptist Convention seminaries are teaching what I put in this book. Um, so the Southern Baptist Convention decided we need to have another safeguard. So they decided to edit the statement of faith that was originally written in 1925 and everybody's eyes was on the statement about the Bible and I'm going to do a little bit of going through the weeds here if you'll be, bear with me. I want to read you the statement and show you how although it sounds good on the surface it had several places that a liberal could walk through a door and continue teaching their liberalism in our schools. All right here it is. The Holy Bible was written by men divinely inspired and is the record of God's revelation of himself to man. Well, that's what the liberals had said. This is not, it, see, we changed that in 2000 and said the Holy Bible is the revelation of God. But they said it's the record. Back to that idea. This is the journal of God conscious people and they put down what they thought God was saying. And then it goes on and says that it has truth without mixture of error. We conservatives said, hallelujah, we've got that in our statement of faith. But then the last line was this, the criterion by which the Bible is to be interpreted is Jesus Christ. And that was the main line that liberals used to excuse what they were teaching. I had a professor from Southern Seminary come down and do a guest lectureship at my college. And he was talking about how Paul was just such an ignoramus when it came to his teaching about women. And he said, I, I just want you to know, I follow Jesus and not Paul. I don't have to pay attention to a th single thing that Paul said, because the statement of faith said the way we judge scripture is through Jesus. That's led us to the red letter Christians that are out there today who are trying to condone homosexuality and others by ignoring what is taught in Paul's letters. Uh, in 1968, Another conservative was elected president, one of my favorite heroes, W.A. Criswell at First Baptist Dallas. Now, in that day and time, whenever you were elected president of the convention, you were allowed to write a book and the convention would publish that book and it would be on sale starting at the next convention. So he took the privilege of writing a book and he wrote a book called Why I Preach the Bible is Literally True. 
Oh, our seminary professors were outraged. Do we have such a rube as a president that he would have a book that was entitled, I Preach the Bible is Literally True, and they made fun of him, and they felt like we were shamed as a denomination? In 1969, we decided to produce our own commentary set using our seminary professors, the Broadman commentary set. Uh, once again, Genesis denied the historicity, historicity of the first 11 chapters, so the convention says, go get us another one. So they got rid of that Genesis and got another one to replace it. But folks, the liberalism is there. I'll give you one example. The, the commentary I'm about to read is the man who would soon become the president of Southern Seminary. Roy Honeycutt. There's a story in 2 Kings where because Elisha was seeing more and more people join the prophets, they decided we've got to build a bigger school for the prophets. And so he said, go borrow an axe. We're going to cut some logs. We're going to build a bigger seminary. And so one man, poor prophet, borrowed an axe. He was cutting near the water. When he threw his axe back, the, the metal axe head flew off and went into the middle of the Jordan River. And he went, sir, sir, that's a borrowed axe. I can never pay for an axe head to replace that one. And what the prophet did was he cut off a stick, threw it out in the middle of the water. And when it hit the water, the axe head that was on the bottom rose to the top. And the King James says it did swim. In other words, the water was going past it, but it was standing there to be picked up. This is how the future president of Southern Seminary explains it. This is from the Baptist commentary we paid for. Gray suggests that the historical event or factual basis resting behind the miracle of the floating axe head may be that Elijah with a long pole or stick probed about the spot indicated, an important point in the text, until he succeeded either in inserting the stick into the socket or having located the hard object on the muddy bottom, moved it until the man was able to recover it. The proposed reconstruction is helpful not only for understanding this single event, but as an, um, as an example of the manner in which historical events were elaborated across successive generations until the narrative becomes a combination of saga, saga and legend inextricably interwoven. He said they're all fairy tales. That's how you approach the Bible. And this is the man that would soon be the president of Southern Seminary. Well, there was a man named Bill Powell. I was friends with his son who actually took down our constitution and studied it and said, there is a way that we can change it. He shared what he discovered with Paige Patterson and with a judge named Pressler, and they decided we've got to get organized, and this was what they discovered. Almost every president of the Southern Baptist Convention has been somebody who believed in the infallibility of Scripture, like Criswell, uh, like, like Owen White, like R.G. Lee, but no one had used this power. They just been ceremonially a president. But here's the power. It's going to be a little difficult to explain, but this is what changed everything. When the president is elected the next year, so you're into year two, he nominates something called the Committee on Committees. And then the next year, the third year, the Committee on Committees nominates part of the Committee on Nominations, nominates the Committee on Nominations. And then the next year, now we're out four years, the Committee on Nominations can nominate one-eighth of the trustees because it takes eight years before you can replace all the trustees when they've done their terms. So in other words, it would take more than 10 years. But if we put someone in the office who was not only conservative but said, I'll use the power to make sure that only commit conservatives will be trustees, we can see this change. Adrian Rogers became that first conservative president who decided, I'm going to draw a line and get this process started, and it started, and it went through. Uh, by the time you get to 1985, we're talking about very slim victories here now, folks, because we have the institutionalists who are saying these are rabble-rousers. The other criticism that those who were on, they called it the moderate side, was that the people we were electing as president of the convention were not strong givers to the convention. Charles Stanley only gave 2%. Adrian Rogers gave 2% to the, to the cooperative program. And so they were saying, how can you be the president of a convention when you have not supported it? So what they would do is they would take a conservative who would protect the institutions, but who gave at least 10% to the, to the cooperative program, and they would run against them. But here's what, here's what you need to understand. It was always customary to allow a person to have a second term without being challenged. So, so they elected Charles Stanley in 1984, 
But that was when the moderates said, this is it. This will be our showdown. And so they picked a man from Amarillo, Texas, who gave over 10%, and they ran him. Russell Dilday, who was the president of my seminary, Southwestern, said, I'm going to fight all the way to Dallas to get Charles Stanley removed, which was way out of bounds. And that's another story. Uh, the bottom line was this, 1985, I was there. 45,000 people showed up for that convention. Uh, we have had conventions in the last decade that would have seven or 8,000 people. A couple of years ago, we passed 10,000. I thought, this is extraordinary. 45,000 came. You wouldn't believe the tension. People were out there giving out their leaflets, giving out their tracts, <laughs> rallying for candidates. Uh, there was no place in the convention center that could hold 45,000 people, so they used the main area where you could actually see somebody in person. Then they had a lot of remote areas. I never got anywhere but the remote areas and watched it on the screen. They would take up our ballots, but that's it. And then they had the showdown of all showdowns. And the end result was that up till then, it had been about a 52-48 vote. That year, Charles Stanley won by a 55 to 45 percent. There was now a 10 percent distance between those who were going to stand by the Bible and those who were fighting to just keep the way things were. By 1990, the, those in that moderate camp had realized they've lost control. The trustees of the seminaries had been replaced. Nobody would teach in a seminary if they did not hold firmly to the Bible. Nobody would be appointed as a missionary if they did not hold firmly to the Bible. They had lost the nomination, so they pulled out and they formed a new group called the Cooperative Baptist Fellowship. Their first head was the pastor at First Baptist Asheville, Cecil Sherman. And then they began to say, we're going to go our way and just ignore you from now on. So it looked like the battle was over, but I've got to explain one more thing about Baptist life to you before we leave this subject. In Baptist life, we have two spheres of influence. The national sphere is where uh, Adrian Rogers became the president. That's where the, the, when you give your money to the, our mission agency, the cooperative program, half goes to the national, that supports the seminaries, that supports the missionaries, that supports our publishing arm. But another part of our money stays in each state, and the states are the ones that own the colleges, and the colleges were still very liberal. So even though we had won the battle in the national denomination, we had to fight in each state. When I came here in 1992, our state was firmly controlled by the moderates and the liberals. Our church at that time was the sixth largest giver to the cooperative program. I could not get an appointment with the executive director because he knew I was conservative and there'd be no place for me. So he just ignored me when I tried to, here we are, we're giving so much money and I can't even get a voice. The shock that came to the North Carolina convention happened in 1995. They assumed they had this. We lost the national, we'll keep the state. When David Horton, who is the current president at Fruitland Baptist Bible College, nominated Greg Mathis, the pastor at Mud Creek Baptist in Hendersonville, North Carolina, to be a president, and everyone knew this is a conservative man. Uh, oftentimes, conservatives never even offered anybody. And the shock was this. By less than 100 votes, Greg Mathis won. And I want to tell you something, folks. There were reverberations all over the state convention office. And you will not believe the things that they were saying about Greg. They, they treated him as if he was evil incarnate, that everything's going to fall apart because we've got this horrible man in charge of the state convention. But I want to testify that Greg Mathis was so gracious during all of that, never responded in kind. Remember, I shared with you that normal thing is to allow a person to have a customary second term. They weren't going to do that. So they thought this is a fluke and they ran somebody against Greg Mathis. And I had the privilege in 1996 of being the one that did his nominating speech for his reelection. And he won by a little bit bigger margin. But the bottom line is this. The margins kept increasing. And in the middle, uh, the early parts of the 2000s, the, the six Baptist colleges we had in our state, which were very liberal, Mars Hill, Wake Forest, Wingate, 
Those colleges saw the handwriting on the wall that one day their trustees would be replaced and they would have to teach the Bible. So they voluntarily said, we're out of here. And the millions that we were giving to them, we're not giving to anymore. Here's good news. Every penny that you give through the cooperative program is going to people who firmly believe the Bible. And there's only one college left that gets any money from the state convention of North Carolina. And the name of that college is the Fruitland Baptist Bible College. And I can assure you that it is firmly conservative and anchored to the Bible. I, I lived through all this. I love talking to people about what I saw. I know almost all of the people that I've mentioned to you I've either met or know personally. But, but here's what you need to know. We put back in place those safeguards that Boyce put in there. I do not believe we're in danger of losing our seminaries again to liberalism. I do not believe we're in danger of losing our mission boards to liberalism. We have got the safeguards. We fought the Bible and we've set up the safeguards and you can have confidence as we move into the future that our denomination is firmly anchored to the Bible as the infallible word of God. Now the question for today is this. How would you say that the battle we've had in the past with liberalism, and, and by that beyond just the Southern Baptist Convention, how will we have to learn those lessons and maintain that balance from now on? Thank you for listening.